since it connects to self-reference, maybe we should start with self-reference and toward introducing it for our listeners who might not be familiar with the immense philosophical, mathematical, logical uh, literature on the subject. It can be problematic, to say the least, in some areas like mathematics, set theory, or computer science, or, or language. But do you have any examples you like to use to illustrate this? Good. Yes. So a couple of things. First, you know, like like everybody at Princeton in the like nineties, we all studied kind of meta logic. It was, I mean, I think less so now, but back when I was in graduate school, it was very much a part of your for, your education in philosophy that you learned a little bit of meta logic. So you learned, you know, um, you learned first order logic, but you also learned sort of all of the important soundness and complete incompleteness theorems in logic. So you ended with Gödel. Um, so that's you know, just part of the prehistory of my own training in this, but it was, it's also, I think it became, um, uh, sort of, I think the common understanding of self-reference is it's just this big can of worms. And that if you're, if you're making a formal system, the one thing that you have to do with, do is stay away from self-reference. So that, that's a kind of, it, it was a part of the background of my understanding of, of, um, you know, sort of logic and stuff that the self-reference stuff was there, that it was problematic, that it was a can of worms and that it presented problems for formalizing things. Okay. Um, It wasn't until I started to think about it in a much more physically embodied concrete way that it no longer seems to me problematic, but it seems to me um, deep and rich and a central piece of our understanding of the world. And it was a simple example like this, that um, I'm going to give you a very simple kind of embodied example of self-reference that made me think, think that actually it's not problematic. I feel like I understand it and I understand why it arises. Um, so I was thinking at the time of, um, I tend to think instead of human beings, I tend to think, put everything in terms of like a little robot, just so that you know that you're not, so that you have a mechanical system that's doing something like representing mm-hmm. the world, but there's no magic involved in it and you know you know, kind of how to understand it through physic, through in a purely mechanical way, and you also know how to understand, you know, um, in a non-mysterious way, you know, the fact that it's representing and so on. So I was thinking of a simple um, embodied computer, a robot, um, and the idea was, what happens if you try to to take a robot like this and make it like a, a complete embodiment of all of our knowledge of the physical? So what do you do? You program it with um, uh, sort of laws of physics and everything that we know about biology and all that we know about history and all of the contingent facts about the world. Um, uh, I mean, everything, like from the color of bananas to the day that Robinson was born to how many hairs he has in his mustache. Um, Is there... (laughs) Sorry. Is there... um, (laughs) is it going to run into problems of any kind? Well, yeah, you can always find a question that you can, uh, sorry, let me regiment a little further again, just to simplify things down to their most basic form. Any, I'm, I'm assuming that any question of fact can be stated in a yes, no form. And that the way that you, without loss of generality, that the way that this, this, um, system is gonna it speaks your language is and you know the language has been resolved of ambiguities and the way that it's going to answer any question is that you're going to put a question in an input channel and it's going to display a yes no on um, an output channel so here's here's the self-reference part you can always find a question that you can ask this thing that um it's not going to be able to truthfully answer what is that question it's a question of mundane physical fact is the answer that's about to appear in the output channel? No. Think about that for a second. It can't answer. But in some ways, nothing mysterious going on. The world is just the normal world, and there's a fact about what appears on the output channel, and you can see exactly what's going on there. It can't answer without rendering false the answer it gives in giving the answer. So you might think, okay, 
um, well, what if we change the what if we change the format in which the answer is in which questions are asked, or what if we ask the question in a different way, or what if we construct the system? And so you can go around in your head about this for as long as you like. And this, I promise you, <laughs> give me any physical system and give me any language with a fixed semantics in which I can ask it questions of fact. I will be able to find a question of fact that it cannot truthfully answer. So what's going on there? What's going on there is pretty clear. I mean, there's nothing mysterious about it. It's exactly what I said, that it cannot give the answer without rendering the answer false. It's true of any physical system in the world. It is what it is to exist, that some of what's happening in the world is stuff that it's doing. When it comes to creatures that are representing the world, creatures like us, so they're simultaneously part of the world and they're representing the world. It's going to be the fact that um, it cannot come up with a complete kind of representation of totality without coming across the fact that some of what's happening is stuff that it's doing at the moments that it's representing the world. Okay. Um, so I call that interference. And by interference, mm. I mean that, you know, it occupies effectively two realms. You know, it's, it occupies the realm of being, so it can't exist without doing things. Um, but it's also representing the world, so everything that it does is going to register at the level of representation, right? Um, and moreover, and this goes back to the the second quote that you put that you brought out when we were talking about. Um, and it's going to be the case that when it's representing the world. Um, its representations and its representational activity are part of what's happening at the level of being. So you've got this kind of involvement of what's going on at the representational level and what's going on at the level of being that makes them inextricable in a way. So I want to, I, I think what the, the stuff about self-reference um, is doing is, is making it in the sharpest, clearest way um, and in a way that's been fairly heavily studied, that that kind of interference is going to be A, unavoidable, and two, uh, B, <laughs> sorry, and B, it's going to complicate um, the ability to give a complete, like to treat representation as though, you know, in the way that we, we generally like to treat representation, which is there's the realm of facts and then there's the realm of representations and truth is a kind of, you know, abstract mapping between the facts and what is, you know, so what is the case and how we represent it. It's going to show you, no, no, when you take account of the fact that that representational activity is part of the world, that's going to make it impossible in some way to give a complete catalog of, 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 um, of, of fact without encountering um, this this interference and all that the the good all that the the sort of what I call the girdle question that is this question that you can't answer truthfully is doing is it's it's taking interference and putting it negatively. I mean, it's making the ne the interference negative. The flip side of that is positive interference, which is of course there are some questions that I can't not answer truthfully. Like, is the answer that's about to appear in the output channel? Yes. Um, but in going in going through the world, I mean, and, but that's a sort of clever way of making a point, which is a much more sort of basic truth that I've that I think is involved in agency, which is, you know, there are some questions of fact that are going to be ultimately and ineradicably up to you, like the some questions of physical fact that you that facts about the world that you're not going to be able to stabilize independently of what you do independently of what you think. Um, hmm. So that's... And I th yeah, I think that this question of stabilization is directly connected to uh, the future and time. So maybe we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, but I really like how this robot example, it really does make the phenomenon real and, and graspable and apparently problematic and... I also like how it connects this or it connects to this duality between representation and world. And this isn't a, a novel point at all, but the discussion of the importance of representation in the phenomenon of self-reference makes it a bit clearer why 
self-reference is such a linguistic problem since language is just in the business of representing things. That's right. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. But now toward I connecting. I one more thing about that. Yeah, please. Yeah. Please. I mean, I think too, it's, it's, and this is the, the way that the, the concrete example is different from uh, the mathematical examples. I mean, I think it's not different in the end, but, but the ways in which it's clarifying. Um, which is that, you know, it's, it's not a problem about ontology. It's not that the world is incomplete. It's that you can't represent the world in complete detail from the inside because there's going to be these facts that you can't stabilize independently of how you represent them. So it's a problem really for representation. It's not a problem for ontology. Mm -hmm.